or as part of a larger project titled Synthesizing Re Research on Resilience in Dry Land and Fragile Contexts, and which has been funded by the USAID Center for Resilience. Through the project, the Feinstein International Center at Tufts has synthesized our research from the past decade on three major themes related to resilience. These are the conflict and resilience nexus, the various pathways to resilience, particularly for pastoralists, and the drivers of persistent global acute malnutrition. These syntheses are designed to provide policymakers and practitioners with insights and recommendations that emerged from a rigorous evidence synthesis across studies and contexts. Today we're doing the first of three webinars, one on each of these topics. If you're interested in listening to the others, I encourage you to sign up through the Feinstein website. Today we'll look at where we see the overlap between resilience and conflict, in, in, sorry, between resilience and conflict or in post-conflict situations. I will start by briefly summarizing key points from the Feinstein Review on what we call this conflict and resilience nexus. To note, we in no way take this to be an exhaustive review, but rather to highlight some of the key issues that have arised from over a decade of work in this regard. The full report and an accompanying short briefing paper on this topic are available now on the Feinstein website, the link to which will appear in the final slide of this presentation today. So the brief uh, summary points on the uh, synthesis piece that we did on Feinstein work. The first point is that conflict undermines livelihoods and resilience through both direct and indirect asset stripping. Also, conflict can transform livelihood assets into liabilities. Assets, including social and human assets, as well as the more tangible physical and financial assets, are key to resilience. Hence, a disruption of people's assets often has a profound impact on their ability to weather conflict or to recover in its aftermath. Second, displacement affects livelihoods both during and after conflict. Displacement might be a direct aim of armed groups or may be a byproduct of livelihood loss and insecurity. Displacement is not random and often correlates to people's identity along gender, clan, political, ethnic, or socioeconomic lines. Displacement forces households to develop new strategies to survive, some of which might be dangerous, destructive, or illegal. At the same time, new opportunities may emerge for groups that were previously marginalized. Gender dynamics often shift as women and children are frequently better able to diversify their livelihood strategies than male household members. Displacement can be long-term or even permanent, translating into permanent shifts in livelihood strategies. Many people may ultimately opt to resettle in urban areas. At the same time, others returning to rural locations may find a loss of access to land and other natural resources. Overall, we see that the impacts of displacement may be felt long after a conflict has ended. Third, conflict is only one of the many factors undermining the resilience of crisis-affected households. Additional factors include access to resources, economic shocks, natural hazards, chronic poverty, politicized violence, and governance failures. While conflict may exacerbate or compound these other factors, we must examine these other factors on their own in order to be able to understand the dynamics of vulnerability. Next, social networks shape people's resilience in the face of conflict. This goes beyond social capital as a livelihood asset and includes people's involvement in social networks and their ability to call upon these networks in times of stress. Membership in such networks often determines remittance flows, the ability to migrate, and the possibility of finding work. However, such membership can also carry social obligations that constrain household resources that are likely to already be stretched in times of conflict. In addition, social networks embody hierarchies of power that disadvantage certain household members and social groups. Next, post-conflict dynamics can severely limit livelihoods recovery Constraints associated with conflict rarely disappear when conflict ends. This is, there is frequently no clear-cut end to a conflict, and periodic spikes in violence continue for some time. 
Even if a conflict has actually ended, its impacts can extend long into the future. Such long-lasting impacts include the loss of productive assets, the death or disability of a key household member, and permanent or long-lasting shifts in economic and governance systems. Lastly, livelihoods programming alone cannot stabilize conflict-affected societies. While the evidence shows merit in programs that seek to provide economic opportunities, livelihood support activities are often inadequate to bring stability and peace. Furthermore, the ways in which such programs are carried out is a factor in whether or not they will contribute to broader peace-building efforts. Next slide, please. Today, we've invited three panelists so that we can have a rich conversation about some of the topics raised in this paper. John Kurtz is Mercy Corps' Senior Director for Research and Learning, where he leads the agency's research and impact evaluation efforts. His research concentrates on identifying how humanitarian and development action can best contribute to reducing conflict and strengthening resilience in crisis-prone context. Uh, could someone mute themselves? Whoever has music, sounds like you're in a cafe, please be sure to mute yourself. I believe it's Dave Cousins, if you could please mute yourself. Luca Russo is an agricultural economist with wide field experience, particularly in Africa. His main areas of expertise are food security and resilience in protracted crises. He currently works at FAO as a senior food crisis analyst and strategic advisor. Luca also leads FAO work in promoting resilience in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Teddy Atim was born and raised in northern Uganda. She brings her personal experience of the conflict of northern Uganda, as well as her years of work as a practitioner and researcher. She has worked with different national and international organizations in northern Uganda over time. Since 2008, she has worked with the Feinstein International Center. All of these panelists long and varied experience and we appreciate their time today. We know that many of you online also have extensive experience and I encourage you to participate in our conversation via your chat function. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Due to some technical difficulties with getting Teddy on the line from Northern Uganda, we're going to start with John at Mercy Corps. John, it's well accepted that resilience is not just the opposite of vulnerability, because resilience emphasizes capacities that enable people to manage shocks and stressors. What are some of the factors that you have found through Mercy Corps' research and programming to be most important for resilience to conflict shock? Are these different than the sources of resilience to drought or other types of shock? Over to you, John. Rich, material in there. Just, can you just make sure that I'm um, coming through okay in terms of the sound? You sound great, John. Thank you. Okay, super. So at Mercy Corps, we've done a number of analyses over the last five, six years. Um, looking at the different sources of resilience across different contexts and really trying to understand um, how they might differ based on the type of shocks that are predominantly uh, experienced in those areas. So ranging from things like drought in East Africa to sudden onset disasters in Central and South Asia, um, you know, looking at conflict dynamics in West Africa as well as other places, we found that some really interesting patterns have emerged. So. To start looking more at um, the traditional kind of focus of resilience around more drought and other climate type of disasters, um, we see that the types of capacities, as we call them in the resilience jargon, or these factors as you describe them, uh, that people rely on to help cope and adapt during those, um, really boil down to things that are um, that look like uh, all farm livelihoods, for example. Um, things like uh, access to financial services, uh, savings accounts, insurance among them, um, as well as, you know, social protection um, and some kind of informal safety nets. 
So those are really kind of key sources that we've seen across um, both drought and sort of natural disaster resilience. Whereas when we shift and, and look at the, the dynamics around resilience in conflict contexts, um, we see other factors that really rise to the top as being, you know, the strongest sources of resilience in the face of conflict. Um, and these are things um, like functioning local government. So, for example, in some analysis that we were doing in Nigeria, uh, looking at resilience to conflict uh, over the last seven years, we see that, you know, functioning basic services, health, education, et cetera, um, was the strongest predictor of both um, uh, child nutrition status as well as sustainable poverty escapes amongst households experiencing conflict. Another key factor that, that we've seen more consistently is access to functioning markets. Um, so we're just finishing up some analysis in Syria looking at households that have managed the conflict and displacement um, relatively better than others in terms of their food consumption, poverty, shelter status. Um, and we've seen there that the stability of market prices and the availability of goods um, is one of the strongest, most consistent sources of, of better coping and adapting in that conflict context. And then there's the one that you've mentioned um, that, that you're and, and Dan and others work points to, which is this social networks and social connectedness. Um, so um, in Somalia, we and others have seen that stand out as, you know, one of the strongest sources of resilience, people's ability to um, especially rely on people across lines of division, um, across larger geographies, um, to be able to cope with both conflict and other shocks. And I, and I, I think there's sort of two challenges that are notable um, as we look at these patterns and the, and the differences between these sources of resilience across conflict context versus other types of shocks and stresses. Um, and the first is that these, these sources that are most important in the conflict context are essentially those that are the most limited in supply um, in fragile environments. So, you know, fragility is, is almost by definition um, a context that lacks uh, governance ability to be able to provide basic services for people to be able to cope with shocks. Um, it's also often characterized by, you know, tears in social fabric um, and social safety nets. So it's sort of an interesting potential contradiction that um, the things that are most important for resilience in these contexts are probably the ones that are um, that are most absent. And, and the second challenge is the second challenge that is notable in there is that there's um, a, a much higher emphasis on what we would call transformative capacities. So thinking about you know local governance, market systems, um, these bigger social dynamics. These are systemic issues that take um, oftentimes more investment and more time to be able to change than, say, some of the more um, individual targeted type of interventions that we might be able to uh, to do to support, let's say, off-farm livelihoods or access to financial services. So, yeah, again, it's sort of a, an added challenge in some of these fragile conflict-affected contexts that, um, that the things that appear most important to strengthen for resilience in the face of conflict um, are those that actually require the potentially the most time and investment. So I'll leave it there for the moment. Great, thank you, John. That was really helpful. Um, I'm gonna pause here and see if we have any questions from the audience for John. Uh, if you do have a question, please use your chat box and we will um, pass them on as relevant. Uh, okay, John, um, your first question. One of the distinct features when working on resilience in the context of conflict compared to, say, droughts, is that, is that it is possible, and some would even say imperative, to reduce the actual shock or stress itself. What role do you see conflict prevention and mitigation playing in strengthening, strengthening resilience in conflict-affected contexts? Sure. So, I mean, this is where I think it gets um, quite interesting from thinking about the, the potential solutions is that oftentimes in a resilience mindset, you know, we look at shocks and stressors as, as externalities, things that we're trying to um, help people and places deal with better. Um, whereas with conflict and other man-made political shocks, um, there's something that we can, and as you say, Liz, you know, um, 
need to do something about to be able to reduce, you know, the instance, the magnitude um, of those. And conflict um, is certainly, you know, an area that a lot of us work on directly, um, leave, leave aside sort of from a resilience approach. So I guess that is a starting point, you know, um, is important to recognize and, you know, be a bit humble that, you know, addressing conflict in all conflict-affected contexts isn't something that, um, especially as humanitarian and development actors, we necessarily are best placed to do. So, so you know, in a Yemen or a Syria where there's sort of heavy state-sponsored violence, um, it may not be a place where we can intervene. But in contexts where uh, conflict is more intercommunal in nature, uh, maybe more localized, there we've had some experiences um, of being able to take uh, peace building and conflict management approaches and um, that have actually yielded uh, resilience results. Um, and the, I think the best example that we have was in southern Ethiopia. Uh, in the years preceding the, the big drought there in 2011, uh, we and others have been doing work around natural resource management and conflict mitigation around uh, natural resource management conflicts uh, and leading to um, joint natural resource management agreements, some peace accords between traditional conflicting groups there. Um, and while this wasn't a resilience-focused program at the time, um, the upshot was that because there was greater trust and freedom of movement uh, as a result of some of this, uh, the peace accords and agreements between these groups, that when the drought did hit, people were, be able, to, people were able to move more freely to be able to access food and water, um, and those households were able to maintain uh, consumption, food security um, at a much higher rate than uh, places where the, the conflict dynamics hadn't been addressed. So that's, I, I think that's one example. One, I guess, distinction and potential caution when we're thinking about um, resilience from a conflict management or a reduction approach is that um, it, it's likely that not all approaches to improving security are, are going to to support resilience. Um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship. So, for example, more heavy-handed approaches to securitization that we see in, in some contexts that are experiencing, um, you know, armed opposition groups or other violent uprisings, um, those may quell the, the violence um, and, and improve security, which is obviously important for development and poverty generally. Um, but what we've seen is that, you know, those approaches are unlikely in the longer term to create the conditions that people need to be able to, um, to, to have resilient livelihoods. Um, and I think um, Northeast uh, Uganda is a good example where, um, you know, fairly heavy-handed disarmament and sort of settlements of, of traditionally mobile populations have had short-term benefits for sure in terms of development outcomes, um, but also limited some of the conditions like mobility that we've seen for those populations um, that are critical for resilience, especially to, to things like drought. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, and John, I'll ask you to mute now while we um, continue along. And could I have the next slide, please? The next theme that we'll move to is that um, will be to uh, to give Luca a chance to discuss his experience. And we're going to talk about the relationship between conflict, agriculture, and food security. <clears throat> Luca, based on your evidence from Syria, South Sudan, and Mali, can you tell us about the role that agriculture plays and can play? Can you also discuss how agriculture might be used to regenerate the fabric of societies after conflicts or during protracted crises, as well as the analytical tools that we need to operate under such circumstances? Over to you, and thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Can you hear me well? Perfectly. Thank you, Luca. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank Let me start with some global numbers, because I think it's important to frame this discussion with some global number. There's been a lot of attention in the course of 2017 to the link between food security and conflict, uh, and this has also been brought to the attention of the UN Security Council. And there's been two major reports which have been published by FAO together with partners uh, like WHO and some NGOs. Uh, one is the, is the standard uh, state of food insecurity, which this year was focusing on the issues of conflict. And the other one is the, is the global food crisis report, which was focusing on acute crisis. 
And both reports tell us a number of very interesting and at the same time worrying numbers. Uh, the State of Food Insecurity report this year, for after many years of progress in terms of number of, of, of the decrease of number of people undernourished, uh, show that there is a worsening of the situation in terms of uh, global number of, of undernourished people. We move from uh, 770 million to 850 million, uh, and, um, and the point is that this is due essentially to the conflict situation in several countries. Uh, it's just to say that uh, out of these 850 million, uh, almost 490 million come from countries where there is some conflict at the moment. So that gives you a really a sense of the importance of these issues. And 75% of the standard children live in countries affected by conflict. The global report on food crisis, which really looked at all the major food crises, including the famous four crises which were uh, of country at risk of famine, that was Northeastern Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, and South Sudan, indicate that 10 out of the 13 major food crises in the world are conflict related. Um, and this is quite interesting because in a certain way, if you think of the humanitarian assistance and the way it goes, 80% of the humanitarian assistance goes into these countries. And in uh, 2016, that, that is the latest uh, figures that we have, humanitarian assistance reached a, a record high 27, 27 billion. Now, the other interesting thing that is agriculture is the sector which is eat disproportionately by this, by this conflict. It's enough to say that 56% of the population uh, of this country lives in rural area, which peak up to 80%. And the point is that uh, uh, and, uh, agricultural investment in terms of ODA is much lower than in, in, uh, in uh, developing countries. We have about 5% vis a vis of 8%. So there's very little attention to, to the agricultural sector in this context. And our funding are very much consistent with, uh, with the, with the Feinstein report because, uh, first of all, it's clear that conflict is not the sole, sole cause of this, of, this, of this situation. There is uh, issues related to, to economic crisis, climate change, and other factors, so it's, it's and, uh, issues around natural resource management, but it's, it's a very important thing. And then, the way conflict impact on, on agriculture is interesting, and again, it's, it's quite consistent with the, with the finding of the Feinstein. It impacts in terms of displacement, you mentioned it. It, 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 it impacts in terms of impact on, 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 on the livelihoods of people. It impacts very much on the issues of uh, social network and, and social cohesion events. So this is, the, in a nutshell, what, what we find at the global level. Now, coming back to some concrete examples, I want just to quote two examples. The one first is on Syria and the an impact of agriculture, and the other one is on South Sudan, is concerned the issues of social network and so on. For Syria, uh, okay, everyone is, at, uh, is, is uh, the attention of everyone is on Syria, on the number of, of the, on the million of people who have been displaced. We are, we are talking of about 11 million people in, between IDP and the refugees. And let's say, at least, uh, to the general public, the issues of agriculture is not really prominent, but at the same time, it's interesting to say that, for instance, that uh, if you have done a, a, a study on damages and loss on the agriculture sector in Syria, and we estimate that the damage is about $16 billion, uh, and, it will, and it will take about $10 billion to, to reconstruct the agriculture sector in, in, uh, in uh, Syria, and the more time passes and the less investment comes into agriculture, the more costly it will, will be to, to reestablish an agriculture, an agriculture sector in, in, in Syria. Now, there are still 6.7 million Syrian people who live essentially out of agriculture, out of a population of 18 million. And this is about 26% of the GDP. Now, Despite all what is happening in Syria, a lot of people stay on, stay on their land, are resilient, and try to cope, and they don't move from, 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 from the, their areas of region, because agriculture is their mainstay, and for them it's absolutely important. Leaving the, their area is for them the last possible resort, and so they are very much reluctant to do, to do so. Uh, 
So what is happening, and we have been having a, a number of very interesting qualitative interviews with, with farmers, basically, and they are saying, uh, uh, we will stay on until we, we can cope with, with our farming, but they, they are simply saying that what uh, in the past used to be very important for them, like agricultural service, uh, seed supply, or for instance, veterinary service are now missing. And in the absence of this, of this service, and if this continue, their residents will be depleted and they will be constrained to move. So that is just to, a, to advocate the importance of agriculture in a country in, in, in a conflict situation. Let me talk some, uh, something about, about the issues of social fabric, which is again very important. And that is a very, a very uh, let's say, well-known region. I'm talking of Adie in South Sudan. It's a region, is a disputed area between South Sudan and Sudan where it has not been possible to find a peace agreement, a durable peace agreement. So it is a sort of temporary administration. There, I mean, this area is, is a hub for what concerns uh, grazing. And these are for people of the Miseria tribe, which are essentially of Arab, uh, Arabic descent, and people from, from the Dinka, they, they are coming from South Sudan. And uh, in the last few years, because of the conflict between the two countries and the lack of peace agreement, there has been an increased number of conflicts around uh, natural resources uh, because of these two ethnic groups. Now, with some uh, basic agriculture service that FAO has been uh, providing together with, with the government, I'm talking of uh, essential veterinary service, um, and using uh, vet uh, veterinary extensionists coming from both uh, the two ethnic groups, we have reconstructed some of the social bond that existed in the past in terms of, uh, of sharing of, uh, of resources and so on. And these are create an environment which has been fundamental in reestablishing some social boundaries between the two groups, and this has eventually led to the signing of local peace agreement for what concerns natural resources, so management. So in a way, through an agricultural intervention, we have been able to, um, to address one of the underlying causes of, of, this, of, this, of this conflict. I will stop here for the time being. Great. Thank you so much, Luca. That's really interesting and really helpful. Um, a question for you, Luca, that's come in. Do you have any practical examples of where you see agricultural interventions help in addressing the root causes of conflict? Okay. On, the, on this, is, uh, thank you for the question. In a way, I already mentioned one example that is the one from South Sudan, but at FAO, uh, just in last, last year, since we want to equip ourselves in, let's say, in a stronger manner in terms of uh, our capacity of addressing conflict, we have done a review of what we do in, in, in different countries. No? And, and we found about maybe 30, 40 uh, um, intervention in which we, uh, FAO, I mean, FAO and partner, had an impact, particularly in addressing uh, some of the root causes of conflict. And if you want to cluster these, these interventions, you can cluster these along two main groups. One is the, the work with the former fighter or ex-combatants, ex and the other one is all the work around natural resource management. So if you have these two clusters, then you find a number of interventions which, which, which are that one of the two. For instance, when you call off the issues of former fighter, the problem of former fighter is to find the, a source of, of revenue once the conflict is over to avoid that they, they go back to conflict. So for instance, we, there is a very good example in the Philippines um, following the Banks Moro peace agreement in which basically the ex-combatants are essentially a far, a fishermen and farmers and through some specific target intervention they have been able to uh, come back to their, their land and cultivate and earn some living and therefore the risk of uh, going back to conflict, I'm not saying that been completely eliminated, have been reduced. On, 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 the, on the natural resource management, we have plenty of examples. I have, for instance, the example of, uh, of a, a border area of Niger where we, we work with, uh, in pastoral areas and, and there was the issues of managing limited uh, water resources between farmers, herders, refugees, and other kind of migrants. So through intervention which allow all the people to have equitable access to the resources, uh, 
and trying to find agreement at local level in terms of the access of resources, we have been able uh, to mitigate the risk of conflict. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Luca. Um, and Luca, you also had mentioned in your uh, overview um, the need for the correct analytical tools. Can you provide an example of an analytical tool that's been particularly successful in your opinion? Well, one analytical tool I can, I can mention is, is the, I think, well-known uh, IPC, the Integrated Food Security Face Classification, which is a tool which is uh, a multi-stakeholder tool. We have about 12 partners working around the, on this tool, which basically is able to classify the severity of food insecurity from escape from one to five, that five is, is famine. It, at the moment, it covers uh, about um, 40 countries, and today is the main tool that alerts uh, the humanitarian community and, and, and the public at large about the risk of famine. I think the, the tool this year, uh, particularly, it has been instrumental in highlighting the risk of famine in the, in the, in the four countries which I mentioned earlier on, that is, that is uh, South Sudan, Somalia, Northeastern Nigeria, and Yemen. And this has, has um, really helped in mobilizing um, a quite substantial amount of uh, humanitarian and assistance in these four countries. And um, famine has been contained, particularly in South Sudan, where it was, it was declared, because it is a tool which basically is recognized as, by all stakeholders as uh, a tool which is solid enough to command, uh, to command the responses. So, uh, we publish this thing on a regular basis. There is a lot of expectation on the, on the IPC. And it also show you trends in terms of how, for instance, libraries are being degraded as a consequence of conflict. Great. That's really helpful. Um, thank you so much, Luca. Uh, and Luca, I'll ask you to go to mute. So we are continuing to have technical problems. Um, our colleague Teddy is in Uganda, and the internet is not uh, behaving as it is meant to, as occasionally happens. Um, but luckily, we have Dan Maxwell, who's um, one of the uh, senior faculty at the Feinstein Center on the line. He's going to step in um, and talk a little bit about the first topic we were going to cover, which is on survival mechanisms and supporting resilient livelihoods in conflict. Um, and I'm going to help Dan out a little bit with a um, question that we know Teddy was going to talk about in her prepared remarks. Dan, can you talk a little bit about the complex ways by which people survive and attempt to keep themselves safe and to protect their livelihoods in conflict? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Liz. And first of all, let me just also do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yep. It's a little uh, a little bit broken, but pretty good. Keep talking. Okay. We're sorry that uh, Teddy couldn't make it this morning. We're still trying to figure, sort out what the technical problems uh, there are. But let me um, attempt to uh, address the question that she was going to address. Um, what we see when we look at, at livelihoods or try to understand the topic of resilience in a conflict uh, context is that the, the, the agendas of security and sort of livelihood security become merged in people's, um, in, in people's activities and people's objectives and what they try to do. And in many ways, although uh, perhaps generically these, these categories sound similar to uh, non-conflict situations, they take on some particular some particular aspects in conflict. So we see people you know, trying to diversify the, their their assets, but, but more importantly, diversifying the risks that they face uh, given their asset portfolios. Um, secondly, we see people trying to maintain uh, flexibility, trying to maintain mobility, uh, oftentimes trying to move assets, especially if we're talking about livestock, moving assets out of harm way, um, maybe even exploited households, moving, moving members of households to different, to different places to try and take advantage of either different um, resource 
services that are available, such as assistance in camps, but also safety, and um, also trying to, to protect immovable assets and maybe you know access uh, employment or other things, perhaps um, neither in the situation where they uh, were living before or in, in uh, organized uh, IDP camps or other, other sources of assistance. Um, and then finally, we, we see a heavy reliance on people's social networks on the connections that they that they have and that they can rely on to help in, in um, times of crisis. In, in, in the Somalia famine in, in 2011, which of course had multiple causes, conflict being, being one, drought being one, um, and a severe market shock uh, also being one, we found people that were able to call on their social networks for uh, assistance, much better uh, able to survive and uh, recover from that from that crisis than those whose social networks were weaker or were actually weakened and uh, to the point of breaking down um, as a result of the of the conflict so we, we see it we see a variety of these kinds of things um, happening and uh, and you know there's the whole there's the whole range of, of, uh, of coping activities we may be familiar with in other in other uh, locations people cutting back on on, on uh, consumption, people cutting back on uh, other kinds of things that they may that they may need. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, I'm wondering if you can also speak a little bit about how people cope with challenges such as asset stripping, displacement, and violence. Um, the uh, yes, several several points there. Um, one is um, that Sorry, can, can you repeat the, the question? Sure. Sorry. How people cope with challenges such such as asset stripping, displacement, and violence? Well, the the, the, the first and most the most uh, uh, obvious uh, coping mechanism is movement, uh, movement away from uh, the source of violence or the, or the, the uh, forces that are stripping assets to locations that may be more um, more safe or, more, or offer uh, some kind of protection. Um, the second one would be uh, to, to gather in, in um, places of, of greater number. And uh, the third one may be around um, trying to, to uh, move assets or um, make people uh, make assets less less uh, attractive or less uh, able to be to be um, um, attacked or stripped by by um, by uh, belligerent forces. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, I really appreciate you jumping in there. Um, and Dan, if you could mute yourself now, that would be great. Um, so I want to go to um, some of the audience questions that have come in, and please continue to send questions uh, via the chat function. Um, John, the first one is for you. Is it possible for external actors to strengthen resilience in extremely fragile contexts, such as current day Syria or South Sudan? And are there any prerequisites for in investing in resilience that should be in place, such as security, access, cooperation from local governments, et cetera? Over to you, John. Uh, well, yes. um, you know, I, I, most of us are interested in trying to push the resilience agenda further into uh, more fragile context where we see it as really needed, but also need to be really realistic about um, what's doable there. I think to start, 
um, maybe making a distinction between, you know, certainly resilience as a thing exists in these places um, insofar as, you know, certain populations and people are, are able to manage um, relatively better than others. Um, but it is an open question of, you know, if as external actors were able to kind of get behind and support those factors that they rely on. Um, just a couple of examples, and I, and I guess the, the sort of the overall takeaway is I, I think the answer is, is yes, but in a, um, in a more limited extent than we could in, in more stable contexts. So, um, for example, building on this, the Syria analysis that I was describing earlier, um, where we are able to see that this access to, to functioning and more stable markets is something that is helping people um, to be able to have better food, shelter, et cetera. Um, okay, what within the, you know, the toolkit that we have as humanitarians and the environment that we're working in there could we do to support that? So, you know, we can't quite go in with a market systems development approach there um, and thinking, you know, 10, 15 years um, as we would need to in that vein, but we can do things like uh, supporting bakeries uh, to be able to, to continue to provide food, subsidize flour to those bakeries, which we, I think others are doing, um, instead of, you know, trucking in food um, ourselves. So that's a way to, you know, meet food needs without um, potentially undermining markets and, or, in this case, potentially um, benefiting a, a local Food, food suppliers, and then I, I think the example that that Luca outlined in uh, in South Sudan is another really good one where you know even in a, in a very um, fragile context like that, uh, there are ways that we can build on an agricultural approach, for example, um, that uh, that helps strengthen some of the social cohesion and, and address some of the underlying conflict dynamics. And then just a, a last word on this is that. Um, there's the question of can we do this, meaning like can we take a resilience approach in, in these very fragile places? Um, and then I think another important question is, you know, should we? And here's where, um, you know, the more pure humanitarians, I think, have um, strong arguments that, especially in Syria right now, you know, there, there's a huge humanitarian imperative to deliver aid uh, to save lives. Um, so if we're trying to do that in a way that builds resilience, that may take away from um, – you know, that, that first order imperative, and I think that we need to make sure that those are always kept with, within our sights, certainly, you know, pushing ourselves to do things smarter in the way we're delivering assistance, um, even if it is short term, um, but not losing sight of uh, in these in these real um, emergency contexts of, of the humanitarian side. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, John. Um, the next question is for Luca. Luca, going back to the example you gave us from ABA, can how could we bring such a tool to scale or such a thing to scale? Okay, that, again, this is of course is the, and this is a bit linked to the to what um, uh, what John just said. I mean. How do you how do you work in a fragile context in a long term perspective? How you build a resilience in a long term perspective in an extremely fragile uh, context? So, in FAO, uh, we we say that uh, while saving lives, you also need to save and protect livelihood, which is in a, in a way put the basis for for a, for a, for a, a, a longer term resilience approach because the more livelihoods are depleted, depleted, the more it will be difficult for people to come back to the to the to the previous state's uh, status once the conflict is over. So therefore, I think it's very important while you are working in this fragile context, uh, saving all the issues about the, the needs of saving lives, to keep on eyes on on the on the issues of protecting and saving and promoting livelihoods. Now, um, how do you do it? The point is, and, and I have an example for this, is that uh, you need to work with, uh, with local institutions, as it is happening in, in, for us in, 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 in ABA, but also as it is happening for us in, uh, in other difficult contexts like the Central African Republic. And um, and maybe FAO, because of his nature of, of, of a multi-governmental organization, has an advantage on this, and try to make sure that uh, what we do, that is the case of the VA, but also in the case of, of Central African Republic, 
become part and parcel of the, of the, in this case, of the government extension service. Uh, in, in ADA, uh, all the extension uh, were provided by government of, office, uh, office, officer, not by FAO. And, uh, and um, this is a way, if you want, to, to make sure that the activities continue and are brought up to scale once they are adopted by, by the government. For instance, in the Central African Republic, a very similar uh, example to the one I, I quoted in ABA, uh, now it has become part, I mean, with all the limits, of the, considering the, the, the situation in Central African Republic, part of the of mainstream government extension service. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Luca, I have another question, um, which I think is best uh, aimed at you, but John or Dan, feel free to step in as well. Um, the question is, do you have examples where conflict has occurred between pastoralists and food crop growers, and where because of this conflict, the value chain broke down with the effect that pastoralists, pastoralists could not gain access to crops and vice versa. Any example of where conflict-sensitive planning or peace-building efforts were helpful in reinvigorating this value chain? Okay, um, what can I say? I, I would say that, that a typical conflict in uh, in, in uh, marginal area is, is exactly the conflict you, you just described. It's between pastoralists and, and, and farmers for access to water, for access to to land, and access to crop. Uh, I don't have a, a, maybe maybe John can, can I don't have a specific example on this, but this is uh, and but this is for instance at the root of the discussion I was mentioning about ABA. Uh, the po the point is in these cases in these cases the issues is to make sure that uh, the the, the two communities found some common common interest and, 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 and in, 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 in some in some form of uh, uh, joint management of uh, of the natural resources which are, which are under dispute. Of course, this depends very much on, on the situation. In some cases, because of climate change, because of overpopulation, um, we are way away from from uh, finding some sustainable solution. But in other cases, particularly there is a prevention. A preventive measure, some of these conflicts can be can be at least contained. Great, John and Dan, did you want to add anything on to Luca's response there? I will take silence to be a no. This is John. Just one example where we've dug into this was in the middle belt of Nigeria, where there's been traditional farmer pastoralist conflicts. Um, and up front, we did some analysis that was just trying to quantify, you know, the, the economic uh, costs of those. Um, we saw something like, you know, the households that were affected by these conflicts um, experienced, uh, you know, a 50% loss in, in incomes over a, a one-year period um, and had some, some similarly sort of big numbers at a, um, at a regional level in terms of GDP for the Nigerian government. Um, we did follow up, and, and, you know, with an evaluation of one of our conflict management programs there, that was able to at least increase, you know, some of the trust and interaction between farmers and pastoralists that had been traditionally um, in disputes. Um, so we saw some interesting results around the, the conflict management um, impacts. You know, what we had expected to see was that, that that would also translate into improved economic opportunities or incomes. Um, that, at least in the time frame of the program, didn't come around. So we think it's an important prerequisite, but um, I think an open question still of, you know, if these types of uh, conflicts are solved, does it, um, you know, essentially solve some of the economic challenges that you were asking about, Liz? Great. Thank you so much, John and Luca. That was very helpful. Um, here's a question which I think is best uh, placed towards Dan, most likely. Dan, in your work, have you seen any successful interventions that support social networks before, during, or after a crisis? Or do you have any practical suggestions for interventions that may help to support social networks? Over to you, Dan. Well, 
thanks. When when you say interventions, I presume you mean you mean organized um, interventions from the outside by by um, uh, you know formally organized programs, etc. Um, and in, indeed, much of our work on this has looked well beyond just uh, what what external programs are trying to do. And I think the takeaway message from that is that first of all, you have to understand how these social networks um, function in, in ordinary times, and how they have been changed or or perhaps undermined or in some cases actually strengthened by uh, the onset of of uh, some kind of crisis or some kind of uh, conflict, and then really understand how the how the dynamics work and what can be done to to work with uh, local social networks. Um, and not necessarily assume that the best way to work with them is is to uh, have some kind of an outside uh, programmatic intervention that goes with them. But perhaps the outside programmatic intervention may, may be about protecting the way that they work rather than trying to to piggyback on top of them. Uh, I mean, I guess most the most obvious example of that that comes to mind, um, again to draw on, on an example from Somalia, was that while well, on the one hand outside um, interveners were trying to protect people from um, a, a very serious uh, humanitarian uh, catastrophe, but at the same time were, were undermining one of the key uh, mechanisms that they relied on in that in that crisis. And what I'm referring to, of course, is the Hawala system or the informal money transfer system by which people both outside the country or inside the country but in a different place would uh, remit remit money to uh, members of their family or members of their uh, immediate kin networks to support them in, in conflict or in crisis. Uh, but because of fears that uh, those same uh, money transfer companies were being used for money laundering purposes or for channeling resources to uh, groups like Al-Shabaab, there was an effort to try and shut down those or, or, or uh, severely limit the access of those um, Money trading companies to uh, Western uh, banking circuits and so forth. So on the one hand, we found ourselves trying to support people's resilience through humanitarian or uh, or, or resilience uh, programs, funded and and implemented from the outside. At the same time, we were undermining one of the uh, key ways in which Somalis uh, were able to remain resilient in the face of of uh, multiple shocks. So I mean, I think the takeaway message is that. Uh, as outside interviews, we really need to understand how these social networks um, work. And in some cases, uh, th they certainly do work to to help uh, get assistance to people that outsiders may not be able to, may not be able to reach. There was there was significant evidence of uh, money in in the uh, cash transfer programs that were, that were being uh, forwarded on to other members of of families, or households, or social networks that had not been targeted for. Assistance, be it, be it uh, livelihood support or uh, just just outright um, access to adequate consumption. But I think the bottom the bottom line message is we need to really understand these networks uh, before we can we can attempt to um, intervene through them. Great, thank you so much, Dan. Um, we're going to send our give our last question to John. Um, John, uh, the question from the audience is, putting activities aside for a moment and instead focusing on program structures and management approaches, have you seen program strategies that are uniquely important to working successfully in conflict settings? And do you have examples of any large programs that have done that especially well? Over to you, John. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks for saving that, um, that toughest one for last. I, I'm going to draw as an example that may not be, um, uh, you know, a, a conflict um, as we're sort of looking at South Sudan and northern Nigeria, um, but want to give an example that highlights um, really structures that support adaptive management, essentially, which is, I think, um, probably the, the main response to this question of, of you know, what, what allows us to work um, well and nimbly in these situations. Um, and the example in this case is actually a bigger resilience programming that we've been implementing in southern and eastern Ethiopia called PRIME. Um, and it's one that is 
um, really in need of a, an, an adaptive approach to management. One, because the context is, is semi-fluid, but also um, the approach that it took was working largely on market systems change, um, which is inherently unpredictable. So the kind of structures they set up in there um, to be able to kind of respond to changes in context and, and sort of understand if and how um, you know the program is is starting to strengthen some of these resilience capac capacities um, has been um, well at least twofold. One, just putting in place uh, you know what we've seen on our analysis of what supports adaptive manage program management um, is one putting in place an organizational culture where there are um, you know basically leaders that give space for, for people to, to think creatively, to challenge, to experiment. Um, so, I, so I think that was, you know, as a starting point, um, setting that out as, as kind of the, the environment for the program. Um, and some of this is documented. I, I could share for, for more specifics. And the second was putting in, that I'm aware of, is was putting in um, a really clear structure for being able to surface new, potentially innovative ideas um, from more of the bottom up. Um, so in this case, there was a a process where you know field staff and partners could submit, I think, what were called concept notes or, or ideas in some structured form that would go through some vetting process and, and understand their viability and their links to the overall project objectives. And um, again, from what I understand of it, and, and I can send along links to the documentation, um, this was a way to be able to both encourage that creative thinking, but then also channel it into you know some of the ongoing program activities that allowed the program to be more responsive to. Um, some conflict dynamics, but also, uh, you know, other shifting contextual elements that were present in that context. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, John. I really appreciate you taking taking that hard one last. And we are just out of time, so we need to wrap up now. Um, huge thanks to John and Luca for all your work and prep on this, and an extra special thanks to Dan Maxwell for jumping in here um, at the last minute. Um, and we know that Teddy is very disappointed that she couldn't be part of this call, and we've certainly missed her perspective, but you'll see her um, email up there with the rest of us um, on the page on your screen now. Additionally, we know there's a number of questions that we were not able to get to, so please send them over to me or to the relevant panelists that you would like to ask them of, and we'll be sure to pass them along. Um, as a follow-up, we will share the webinar, webinar recording with you in the next couple of days. Right after you leave this webinar, a very short survey will pop up. Please do us a favor and take two minutes to fill it out. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all so much. Have a great day, and we hope that you'll join us for our next two in January. All the best.